All right, kids, once upon a time, not long ago, when people wore pajamas and lived life slow, there was a B-girl and graffiti artist named Cindy Campbell who decided to throw an end of summer party in order to earn extra money for school clothes. Her older brother, Clive, would play the music because people around the way knew him as DJ Cool Herc. Their event, which took place in the recreation room of their apartment building at 1520 Sedgwick Avenue in the West Bronx, would come to be known widely as the birth of hip hop. The date was August 11th, 1973. Today, in the midst of Black Music Appreciation Month, we're gonna talk about rap music and its impact on America. However, we'll focus on Black America specifically because for decades now, there's been an argument that hip hop has a negative effect on us. We're not against rap. We're not against rappers. But we are against those thugs who disgrace our community, our women, who disgrace our culture, and who have absolutely nothing of redemptive value to offer except the legacy of violence and sexual assault and foul language. Hip hop has done more damage to black and brown people than, than racism in the last 10 years. When you, when you find the youngster, a Puerto Rican from the South Bronx or a black kid from Harlem, who has succeeded in life other than being the one-tenth of one-tenth of one percent that make it in the music business, that's, that's been a success in life walking around with his pants around his ass. They don't seem to see any connection between the kind of music which they sell for profit uh, and the kinds of problems we have in American society. So, as you'll see today, if you're gonna say that rap music or black culture in general is the cause of the disproportionate amount of gun violence seen in black communities, you're gonna to have to know one, when rap music began, and two, when proximity crime in impoverished and segregated neighborhoods began. And it would help if you had an appreciation for black music too. With that in mind, let's get to when did rap music begin? Well, it's not as simple as I made it out to be earlier in this video. There's evidence of black people rapping before the 70s, but if you did quick math on the date I provided a minute ago, or if you watched the 65th Grammy Awards a few months ago, the Grammy stuff for black people, then you'll know that 2023 will mark hip hop's unofficially official 50th birthday. See, Early on, rap music was mostly about the DJ, like DJ Cool Herc, who I already mentioned, Grandmaster Flash, and Africa Bambata. They innovated how to use turntables and were instrumental in getting people together with block parties. Then there was the master of ceremony, the MC. They would be at parties on stage with a mic, encouraging people to dance, giving shout outs, and making announcements. Rhyming evolved from that over time to what we now know as rapping. Real quick, before I continue, the term hip hop was coined by one of hip hop's early pioneers, an MC and a member of Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, Robert Keith Cowboy Wiggins in 1978. No relation though. Speaking of Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, in 1982, Sugar Hill Records produced The Message by Melly Mel and the late great Duke Booty. While the vast majority of rap music that came before this featured beat breaks from James Brown songs, reggae, and dancehall tracks, with some disco influence in order to keep the party going and have a good time, The Message was and is rhythm and poetry's reflection on inner city blues. Those living for the city. Seems like it was the first song of its kind. More on this later. We have the answer to our first question, therefore let's get to the second one. When did what's known as black on black crime begin? That's a lot more difficult to figure out. Gun crime and violence in black communities was already a thing before Schoolie D, Ice-T, and N.W.A. pretty much invented gangster rap in the mid to late 80s. It was also a problem before former President Ronald Reagan remixed the war on drugs. Actually, black and black crime was a problem before Richard Nixon declared drug abuse public enemy number one on June 17, 1971. We know this because gun crime and violence must have already been such a huge problem in Chicago that the term black on black crime was perhaps first put in print to describe what was going on in August 19, 1970. Hey, if you're keeping score at home, then you already noticed that black on black crime, the violence, along with the term used to describe it, were already things before Cindy and Clive Campbell decided to even throw their back to school jam, which should mean rap music is not the cause of crime and violence in black communities. It isn't. 
we could end the story right there. However, so I've been wanting to make this video for a while. I don't know why I haven't. But the idea that rap music can somehow be the primary cause of crime and violence makes no sense to me. One, because when you say something is a cause of something else, there's a presumption of chronology. And what do I mean by that? You're basically stating that this existed before and independently of that. So when you take that alone into account, the original claim doesn't make any sense. Because it's not like Atlanta was all sunshine and rainbows and then 21 Savage came out and said, I'm gonna wet your mama house and wet your grandma house and keep shooting. And then and all of a sudden Atlanta started getting dangerous. Like that's not, that's not how things work. So let's say you didn't mean to say cause, but rather exacerbate. So rap and drug music makes these problems like violence and crime worse. That's your new claim. Okay, okay, now you're starting to eat. I still got a rebuttal for you though. Let's talk about what art means fundamentally. The general definition, but art is essentially, I'm gonna use four E's here, the expression of environment, emotions, and experiences. So if you want artists to remove violence out of their expression, you have to remove the violence out of their environment, emotion, and it, you see how I'm getting here? Art is a mirror and it's reflecting a violent city. People walk up to the mirror, see its reflection, and then some may walk away being more violent. So you could turn the mirror to prevent that from happening and show something else. But what about the violence still happening over here? So should we just turn the mirror or should we fix what it's actually reflecting? Tangent time, now that we've reached the 1960s in my weird backwards timeline. There's this idea that black culture could also be blamed for the murder rate among black people. And it goes a little something like this. Liberal policies in the welfare state led to fathers abandoning their families, which in turn leads to babies being born out of wedlock, therefore more violence. And it's okay to admit that absent fatherhood became more of an issue after the 60s, whether or not it was an intentional or unintentional consequence of social programs. Because I'm glad people are admitting that poverty was a factor in absent fatherhood. That's a case then and now. White women are currently the fastest growing demographic to have babies born out of wedlock. And although their rate isn't near that of Hispanic women or black women, for that matter, based on its current rate trajectory, it will be in a few generations. What policy led to this? Are these white women or even Hispanic women influenced by black culture? Or are the markers for absent fatherhood not race or culture, but poverty and a lack of resources, healthcare, and education, which are also features of poverty? Can't stress that enough. It's like the hook to this song of mine. I'm gonna repeat it till it's catchy. Anyways, we've talked about this. Studies show that when you control for concentrated poverty in segregated neighborhoods, the disparities in violent crime between black and white communities almost disappear. So blaming absent fatherhood, again, a symptom of poverty, for violent crime, which is also a symptom of poverty, is like somebody coughing because they have a cold and someone looking at them and saying, might be because of that runny nose of yours. You know what? In 2019, America's pre-pandemic murder rate was 5.0 per 100,000 people. It peaked somewhere in the late 70s, early 80s, depending on your source, yet was 5.0 in 1960. So the murder rate both increased and decreased while rap existed. I want to act like I didn't just say that. The comment section will too. Just to keep going and say, even with that, Let's go back to my timeline and look at some case studies from around the country in order for me to prove my point. In 2012, a record low 231 California black youth were locked up in state correctional facilities compared to over 2000 in the mid 1990s and 800 in 1959, the first year numbers were kept. Quote, status crime policing of black youth reflected in curfew, loitering, and other non-criminal stops also had fallen to record lows. Little solid evidence connects policies to reduce crime, except maybe for the correlation with increased college enrollment. Maybe. Going from 1959 to the 40s, there was a world war then, so I'll skip that. In New Orleans during the early 1920s, African Americans were two thirds of homicide victims, 86% of whom died at the hands of other African Americans. Yet prosecutors secured convictions in only 6% of African American intra-racial homicide cases per the study. Less crime, more punishment, violence, race, and criminal justice in early 20th century America. From the 1920s to the 10s, there was a world war that decade too, so we'll skip that. Even so, what soundtrack were white supremacists listening to during the red summer of 1919? Moving on, and racial integrity and other features of the Negro problem, A.H. Shannon said, quote, while conditions in Denver bear a strong resemblance to those in some of the Southern cities, there is a marked difference in the grade of crimes committed. From the 1st of May to the 1st of September, 1906, there were 10 killings in Denver. Five of these, including the murder in cold blood of two police officers killed in the discharge of their duty, were the work of Negroes. One Negro was killed by a white man 
who was acquitted because he acted in self-defense. So that we have 4% of the population committing 50% and involved in 60% of all killings during this period. 10 Negroes and 11 whites were involved. Violence among black people and in black communities was a problem at the turn of the 20th century. Well before rap, well before what's perceived to be contemporary black culture, well before the welfare state, well before absent fatherhood. The only thing that remains constant from now until then is black people living in concentrated poverty and segregated neighborhoods. With all of that said, if the hip hop movement never happened, black people's intraracial murder rate would still be between 88% and 93% year to year. If we took away rap, the dangerous material conditions that create and bring about violence would remain. Furthermore, when those who claim that black people don't do or say anything about black on black crime, I automatically point to rap music to disprove that nonsense. Songs like Self Destruction and Same Game dropped when I was a little boy. These were the first stop the violence movements that I ever knew of. Kind of seems like there aren't tracks like this anymore, but they're out there though, yet they haven't reached the mainstream, which is an issue in and of itself. I don't know if this is a supply issue or a demand issue, but we could make an entire episode about the idea that mostly white record executives didn't want to sell positivity. So what started to happen was when Public Enemy, and I remember this vividly, my, my album was called Knowledge is King was going into a whole spiritual space about knowledge and being intelligent. KRS-One was saying Jesus was black. And Public Enemy was saying it takes a nation of millions to hold us back. That's all 88, 89. And by the time we got to 90, the powers that be said this black conscious movement is moving without radio play, it's moving completely underground, and there's an underground subculture of positive, pro-black, intelligent people. We cannot have this movement happening. So the unfortunate part for gangster, quote-unquote gangster rap was they started to handpick what they were going to play. And this is the part that you know. They went from not playing rap because they said it was too edgy and not melodic enough to playing the most profane rap and beeping the curses out. That's how bad they wanted to get that content on the radio. And I bet there are a lot of artists who feel like the audience wants to hear about money, cash, and hoes, sex, murder, and mayhem, ignorant stuff they like. Real gangsters talk about that reality, which is theirs. Those who don't live it think that they either have to ride with it or their careers die. Sometimes I wish that more rappers would report on their actual surroundings, whatever they may be. I know there has to be a rapper who rhymes about data and studies presenting injustices like I'm doing here. But just like that information, apparently, we gotta find it because it won't be put in heavy rotation. I want artists to give us their hearts, souls, minds, thoughts, feelings, and experiences. But hip hop is more complex than that though. The art of storytelling, you know, like outlaw country music or subgenres of rock that also perpetuate gun violence, which get a pass in a country that also has a lot of mass shootings and suicide. For an example of what can be seen and heard in 1970s, 1980s New York, there's the message. I'm not even gonna rap Melly Mel's lyrics. My flow wouldn't do it justice. This is just the first verse. Melly Mel and the late Duke Booty will go on to talk about crime, being poor, cycles of vengeance, violence, unemployment, drug use, all the while telling us, don't push me cause I'm close to the edge. What do people who don't appreciate black music think that means? Poverty and segregation did that. It's been 41 years since that song came out and it's been 50 years since hip hop was born and y'all are still missing the message. Happy birthday hip hop. We gonna be all right. <laughs>